solutions, right? I mean, we hear about solutions everywhere, in the corridors and on, on stage. This is about solutions. I'm not going to make a big speech, but just highlighting two key uh, messages that you'll hear throughout the two panels. One is about cooperation, and you see here a great lined up of speakers from various organizations. This is about cooperation. Cooperation is the new competition. We have to work together. The second message is about uh, nexus approach, integration. We're looking at nature-based solutions, that would be the topic of the first round table, and other solutions, yeah, technology, all kind of solutions. We have to mix all of these different solutions together. We're talking about jigsaw puzzle, huh? not, a, not a silver bullet for solutions. Those are the key things I'd like you to um, take out of this message. Without further ado, I'm very pleased to have um, the keynote address delivered by His Serene Highness, Prince Albert II of Monaco, and I invite you to pay attention to um, the video, video message that he's delivering. Next, uh, I'll hand over to uh, Dr. Nathalie Hilmi from the Centre Scientifique de Monaco, and she'll introduce the great and fantastic speakers we have on today. Thanks to all of you for being here. Without further ado, let me invite the video and the welcoming message from His Serene Highness. Thank you very much. Ocean acidification lies at the confluence of these three crises. It draws attention to the effects of unsustainable human activities, as well as the way in which they affect our society, raising concerns such as food safety and food supply. And it highlights the economic consequences that are already noticeable in so many sectors. As such, acidification enables us to address these issues in a coherent manner, where, whereas the fight against climate change and the fight against loss of biodiversity are often dealt with separately. However, just as the causes of these crises largely overlap, the solutions to be implemented should form a whole. I'm, of course, referring to nature-based solutions, which we've talked about a lot, on which the IPCC and IPBS working for the first time together, have just devoted a significant part of their joint report. This work has highlighted the benefits of policies to better protect, manage, and restore ecosystems. These nature-based solutions should be integrated in, into our policy tools if we want to honor the, the commitments made within the framework of the Paris Agreement. We need to do this especially for the marine environment, which, of course, we are concerned with here. The preservation and restoration of marine ecosystems often unparalleled opportunities in terms of climate change mitigation. They also enable the, the, the sustainable development of local communities thanks to the sustainable and fair exploitation of marine resources. And they help to strengthen carbon sequestration capacity, what is known as blue carbon. And let us not forget that coastal marine ecosystems have a much greater carbon storage capacity and over a much longer period of time uh, than terrestrial ecosystems, particularly forests. This capacity must now be valued economically. This is one of the reasons why I've made uh, efforts for, for so many years with my government and my foundation to develop and strengthen marine protected areas. These marine protected areas are currently the best tools for, per, for the protection of our seas their fauna and their flora. However, although their surface area has increased, it, is, it still covers a too small of an area in the global ocean. Consequently, these solutions need to be developed as we are doing so in the Mediterranean with the creation of the Med Fund, which we launched with France and Tunisia a few years ago. And the Med Fund, as we heard, just had its uh, assembly here a few days ago. And the, so MedFund raises funds to promote and, and strengthen the network of marine protected areas in the Mediterranean. Beyond MPAs, one of the key challenges is the resources that need to be mobilized to develop nature-based solutions. The funding allocated needs to be much higher than the current 3% of the total funding for climate. In order to do so, we need to make the private sector aware of these opportunities that they offer and the possibilities of creating sustainable business models. We also need to better mobilize states and encourage them to work together. 
especially in regards uh, to uh, matters concerning international waters. The various UN agencies must therefore help to define feasible, realistic, and progressive protocols of agreement. Protocols that are not just sectorial, but global, with an integrated management focus involving coastal, open water, and deep sea ecosystems, and taking environmental, social, and economic issues into consideration. For all these reasons, it is vital that we now become more widely involved in these issues as a, as a continuation of this workshop. The workshop for, to which the Prince Albert II of Monaco is referring is the fifth workshop on the economics of ocean acidification, which continued to theory initiated in 2010 and built on the work developed by the previous editions in, edify, in identifying and evaluating the socio-economic risks of climate-driven changes in the ocean as well as the most vulnerable regions and area of human activities. The workshop focused on the use of marine biological processes to ameliorate and mitigate climate change, their benefits and trade-offs. It connected the scientific knowledge and the concept of blue carbon in coastal, open ocean and deep sea ecosystems with the social disciplines for quantification of climatic benefits at local and global scales. Liza Miller is a climate geochemist at the Institute of Ocean Sciences with Fisheries and Oceans Canada, and specializing in CO2 drawn down and sequestration in polar waters and sea ice biochemistry, former chair of the Solar Scientific Steering Committee, currently a member of the Future Earth Governing Council. Liza Miller is going to give us an overview of ocean carbon to set the stage. The floor is yours, Lisa. Hello, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this very exciting discussion today. I want to start by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from the unceded Coast Salish territory of the Lekungwin and Wasanich nations, whose cultures and livelihoods are still intimately connected to the seas surrounding our area. So I was asked today to give you a very brief overview of ocean carbon in order to set the stage for our discussions on carbon sequestration today. This summary of the global carbon budget shows that the air-sea exchange of carbon dioxide is essentially in balance. However, these large numbers hide a net anthropogenic drawdown into the ocean that is quite significant in relation to anthropogenic carbon releases. Therefore, anything that increases drawdown or decreases carbon dioxide release from the ocean has the potential to significantly impact this net anthropogenic drawdown. I now want to take a closer look at the details of the global carbon cycle, in particular the marine sector. In order to significantly impact this essentially balanced air sea CO2 exchange, it's necessary to get carbon dioxide out of the surface ocean and down deeper. You can see here that both ocean circulation and marine biota do indeed export substantial quantities of carbon out of the surface waters. However, the vast majority of that just comes straight back up into the surface on time scales of only within a few hundred years. A, only a very small fraction gets buried deep in the sediments to actually be stored away for longer periods. Within the context of the global carbon cycle, the natural processes that release carbon from such long-term storage, volcanism and rock weathering, are very slow processes that operate over very long time frames and are balanced by burial and ocean sediments on land. What we've done in burning fossil fuels is essentially accelerate this release from long-term storage by more than an order of magnitude. 
Now, this is the main point I want to make today, is that these natural sequestration processes simply can't keep up with this. These processes cannot solve our climate problem on any short time frame, anything less than several hundred thousand years. On the shorter time scale, the only thing they can do is help us keep the problem from being even worse. Now, this is actually very important. This is an extremely valuable service the ocean can provide to us, as long as we ask nicely enough. The final point I want to make is that even with successful carbon sequestration, there will be undesirable consequences that have to be acknowledged and accommodated for. And so on that cheery note, I will finish with a challenge to the rest of our speakers and panelists today. And that is, what are the tools we have? And more importantly, what are the tools we need to resolve this conundrum? How can we make sure that the ocean is able to help us deal with our climate problem? And with that, I will close and hand the floor over to Natalie for our first panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. So we are starting the first a panel about the role of marine nature-based solutions to mitigate climate change, their benefits and trade-offs. The first panelist is Perry Maske. Perry Maske is a research scientist with the Radioecology Laboratory of the IAEA in Monaco since 2020, when he joined the agency from Australia, where he was a professor at Edith Gourmand University. Before, that he was a professor at the Autonomous University of Barcelona. He has been working on the carbon cycle in the ocean for the last two decades. And Perry will tell us about the concept of blue carbon in coastal, open ocean, and deep sea ecosystems. Perry, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Natalie. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I wanted to give uh, a brief, a brief overview of the blue carbon concept, taking, taking from what Lisa explained a second ago. Uh, and I don't know if you're going to show my slides, otherwise I can share my screen. Should I? But basically what she pointed out was that we are increasing tremendously the amount of carbon that's emitted into the atmosphere. And uh, we've, we've, we've seen how the forests can take a lot of this, uh, basically, CO2-derived emissions uh, by photosynthesis and net growth, but uh, we, we need more than that. And actually, the oceans are helping on, on it. We know how much the oceans are taking. Some of that is by physical processes by which the CO2 exchange with the atmosphere is taken down by the circulation, but some of that is by sinking of particles. That happens in the open ocean. We call it the biological pump and by which the plankton fixes carbon uh, through photosynthesis and exports this via a number of different processes, but basically by sinking particles. Now, we know about that. Uh, there is a lot of variability still, but there is not much we can do to reinforce that, to enhance that process. However, in coastal habitats, we do have a big opportunity. That opportunity has to do with the presence of what we call uh, coastal vegetated ecosystems. That's uh, mangrove, that's seagrasses, that's salt marshes. The, this kind of systems occupy a relatively small piece of the ocean surface. It's less than 0.2 percent, so two per mil. Uh, but we estimate they accumulate about 50 percent of the carbon, organic carbon, that's right in the ocean. And uh, that's, that's a lot, actually. And why is that so important? It's because they're very rich in accumulating carbon. It's by an order or more of magnitude than what we find in the shelf and the deep sea. And the accumulation rates are very large. We find these systems all around the place. Now, they, they've been acting like that forever, and they shall, but we're destroying them. So we all have seen images of, you know, uh, mangrove deforestation, or seagrass disappearing because of a number of uh, impacts or, uh, that, that we produce. Some, some naturally, if you want, but many, many are not. Now, I'm going to finish this brief introduction with just uh, a couple of numbers. I mean, we, we estimate that the global carbon stocks accumulated in mangroves, salt marshes, and seagrasses 
and the the carbon rates that the, the rates that by which they bury this carbon are very high higher than what happens in the forest on land for instance but even more importantly if we were able to reforest the the land and that would give us a major potential for mitigation climate change be a restoration uh, the same can happen with restoration of seagrasses, salt marshes, and mangroves, each of them comparable or higher than the forest capacity in total numbers. So it's a, it's a major issue, and that's why this session is pertinent, and the efforts on blue carbon worldwide are, are relevant and increasing. And I leave it here, Natalie. Uh, Patricia Morales, the General Manager of Philanthropia Cortes Solari. A foundation dedicated to enhance integrated sustainable development in Chile. She's an economist graduated from the Catholic University of Louvain. Through the implementation of three elemental reserves, the foundation is developing concrete activities of effective conservation in the field, promoting nature-based solutions to climate change. And Patricia is going to tell us about the, con the, the valuation of marine ecosystem services. And now? Now better, okay. So thank you for this invitation. Uh, we have tried to work around this main challenge consisting to introduce the um, marine ecosystem services in the economic rationality. I have some slides that I bring with me to, to ex expose this. I don't know if Clement have those slides with him, otherwise I, c I just can't talk. The thing is that for us, it's a main challenge because we all know that in the global GDP, the global GDP do not consider in his calculation the use of the nature, uh, in particular in those economy uh, like our economy in Chile, where all the industry matters is very intensive in re uh, natural resources. So what we try to do, this is not my presentation, by the way. Yeah, this is another presentation. Maybe we can just wait to cross all those slides. Yeah, this is my presentation. Thank you. The green one? Okay. Ah, great. <laughs> so, as I was saying, um, well, we have these challenges because obviously, for one hand, the oceans account for more than 60% of the global GDP, but mainly due to the extractive and highly polluting industry such as aquaculture and so on. And obviously the global GDP doesn't account, doesn't take into account uh, the calculation of the marine ecosystem services in particular and neither uh, the land ecosystem services. So there is this kind of dominant discourse consisting to say that the oceans are the future of the economy grows. But obviously it, it doesn't take into account the social, environmental, and economic risk of the extractivist model developed until now. And this is why, from Mary Foundation, we have been trying to work around a pilot called Blue Body Initiative that tried to protect whales, not only because whales are very beautiful species and very important in the marine ecosystem services, but also because whales uh, capture carbon uh, in a very significant whale, e each whales capture around 33 tons of carbon, means 1,003. So we really believe that if we try to put a value, an economical value, on a price on these uh, marine ecosystem services, maybe we can change the paradigm. We can start to change the paradigm, uh, the economic paradigm of that. Before I have to say that the ac this accounting imbalance translated to an in um, in imbalance in the GDP associated with the oceans. We have a lack of economic valuation of the negative externalities produced by the current production matrix in terms of damage and impact of those marine ecosystem services. We also have a lack of economic valuation of marine ecosystem services that could be a part of blue-green production matrix. Thank you. And uh, most, we have a total absence of public policies and private investment in the blue economy. So, I'm just going to show very quickly uh, this video, if it works, otherwise, no. 
yes, it works. And it does have any sounds, so it doesn't work. It doesn't matter. So the thing is that what we try to do is to work in marine ecosystem services from four dimensions. The environmental one, the social one, the cultural one, and the economical one. We really believe that to face the climate change, it's not enough to understand the science. We already have enough scientific evidence, okay? We already understand the whales, what are the main uh, anthropogenic threat that they, ha they have to face. So we continue to analyze uh, the environmental uh, conditions of the whales and we try to protect them through our um, automatic monitoring system. But the main things now is try to evaluate all their uh, marine ecosystem services to put a price. And the most difficult thing is the, is the institutional part, consisting to create a regulation, to create a new kind of common, um, not a public good, as we were talking with Natalie, but a common good in order to define that maybe some species should be a common good where we could define a price and incorporate this as an active in the global uh, active of the, of the country. And maybe we can change the way and the economical rationality. This is what we, ha we are trying to do from Blue Green, Blue Body, Blue Body Initiative. And I invite you all to visit our web, www.marifoundation.com, in order to uh, know this initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patricia. Eric Van Dorn worked in the legal office of the International Tribunal for Law of the Sea in Hamburg before he moved to the Kiel University for his PhD in International Fisheries Law. In his current research, Eric focuses on mineral and living resources, the legal implications of marine spatial planning, and the legal aspect of marine uptake of carbon dioxide. He has been a member of the Solar Scientific Steering Committee since 2017. And here Eric will tell us about law and governance, integrating nature-based activities into a multi-regulatory uh, governance system for nature-based solution. Eric, the floor is yours. Thank you very much to all the organizers for inviting me to give this uh, short talk. Um, Clément, shall I share my screen or will you do it? Um, let me see. Yes, you should now be able to see my screen, I hope. Um, I will show you this slide first because I want to emphasize that not all the sustainable development goals are Eric, you are muted. Sorry, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I don't know what went wrong. Um, I apologize. Um, the um, uh, Goal 13 on climate action and goal 14 on life below water are obviously the goals that we um, concentrate on today. Um, it's not always easy to achieve both. If we want to have uh, increased the CO2 uptake of the ocean through natural means, this might um, be a must under the climate change framework, uh, legal framework, uh, as a sink. Um, it might, however, also um, be regarded as pollution under the law of the sea framework. First of all, I want to show you this slide and I want to emphasize that um, within the first 200 nautical miles, the, um, any natural based solutions will fall most likely within the jurisdiction of the coastal state. Eric, Only if we have natural Eric, solutions beyond Eric, excuse that. Me, excuse me, Eric, can you put your slides in a wide format, please? Because we don't see them well. You don't see them? You see them now? Yeah, but can you put it open screen? Uh, 
I actually have uh, no it's other okay. means. It's okay, don't worry. You go ahead, please. Okay, good. I will do it um, uh, then uh, maybe better without the slides. Um, I want to emphasize that um, no. Uh, no, we... No, it was okay. It was okay. Like, you, can, you can put your slides. It was just... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, then there they go. Good. Summarizing, the coastal state will be responsible within the two, first 200 nautical miles from the, um, uh, from the coast for natural-based um, solutions for climate change. Beyond that, there will be no coastal state jurisdiction over such thing. Um, I'm not going to read out the definition, but this is just to show you that in 1982, states still did not think about anthropogenic climate change as much, and this is where the definition for marine pollution um, comes from, from the Law of the Sea Convention, which was concluded in 1982. The problem here, however, is that you could qualify CO2 uptake of the ocean as marine pollution instead of a solution. Um, in general, and I call this cli slide climate um, intervention, um, but it also applies to natural-based solutions, what activities that are not forbidden under international law would be allowed. And there is no general prohibition of climate intervention nor for natural-based solutions, luckily. However, there is not really a treaty regulating these ideas as such. Um, existing regulation, however, general international environmental law will also apply to um, uh, climate intervention and natural-based solutions. Implementation, I put that on the slide because everything hangs together with the implementation of states of international or regional law. What I want to emphasize on my last slide is that if we want to increase the capacity of the ocean to take up carbon dioxide through natural means, we actually might have to think about, is there not a duty if we really need the ocean, and it seems that we do, uh, if we really need the ocean, is there no duty to be derived from that for restoring ecosystems? And that is what we're currently working on. Thank you very much for your attention, and I apologize for the technical problems. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Uh, Lisa Brias is a professor in geomicrobial biology at the University of Bergen and scientific director of ocean sustainability in Bergen. She has extensive experience from field work in the Arctic Ocean and South Pacific Ocean studying the effect of climate change on biological diversity. She has also been heavily involved in working on science advice for policy decisions, both nationally and internationally, as council member of the European Academy of Science Advisory Council. She was newly elected as president of the Norwegian Academy of Science and later from 2022. Uh, Liz is going to tell us about education and research and higher education and integrated ocean research for sustainable nature-based solutions. Liz, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me to, to attend this session on higher education and integrated ocean research for sustainable nature-based solutions. So the ocean has greatly showed the rise of climate change, but at a cost. The ocean has also warmed, acidified, and lost oxygen, while circulating patterns are changing and sea levels are rising. The continuation of these changes not only threatens the marine ecosystem, but also the future ability of the ocean to indirect support life on Earth. And therefore, the ocean matters in climate negotiations. The ocean already has absorbed 90% of the extra heat energy stored on the planet, arising from increased greenhouse gases. So it's uh, easy to ignore what you cannot see, and I would like you to introduce you to Emiliania Huxley. It's an electron microscopy of an algae. It's one of the most extreme, it's an extremely cosmopolitan acropolis forest species. And in one liter of seawater, you have t one to 100 millions of these cells. Uh, they are very important contributor to the oxygen production of Earth. So 50% of the oxygen on the Earth is coming from the ocean. This, uh, this organism is also a very productive calcifying organism. 
So it has significant impact on the biochemistry on the Earth, detect, directing carbon at chemistry in the surface ocean and exposing large amounts of carbon to the deep water sediments. So they are small, but they are many, and they are very important in the ocean acidification and the future of our planet. As we already heard, the ocean is one of the largest carbon reservoirs on Earth with about 50 times more carbon than the atmosphere, with the largest reservoir in the deep ocean. We do have seven main sinks that's given in gigatons of carbon, and our goal must be to find control points from pulling more carbon from the atmosphere uh, to one of the other six sinks. We are fast approaching climate tipping points, seen as a gateway to dangerous climate change, and we need to reduce the emissions. Therefore, we also need new innovation and action towards carbon capture for sequestration and utilization. We need to focus on next generation biotechnologies for carbon capture, uh, sequestration and utilization, supported by engineering design principles derived from ecological perspective. So the scientific knowledge of carbon cycling and engineering solutions for carbon capture and storage and utilization is needed to foster awareness of the problem and close the gap between the fundamental research and industrial action. So some examples of the activities we have on best practices. The uh, University of Bergen was appointed by uh, United Nations to take lead on the SDG 14, the International Association of University, uh, uh, on higher education for sustainable development clusters. So by doing, being part of this, we uh, established a cluster with 16 uh, international partners worldwide that we uh, uh, started to collaborate on. And then uh, some of the activities that we have with this cluster is that we are doing webinars, workshops on emerging SDGs and, and targets such as reduce marine pollution, protect and restore ecosystems, among other. We have also, as uh, on the slides, uh, uh, published a no and finalist in publishing a publication on higher education engaged with SDG 14 life below water, where we have in, invited universities and experts worldwide to contribute to this publication. So this is going to finish next week, and this is an example of how we're using our international network to promote research and collaboration and to, de to detect science gaps from the science policy interface. We also partner on the Ocean Teacher Global Academy training courses hosted by intergovernmental oceanographic committee programs that contributes to the United Nations Ocean, Ocean Decade. So through this, we also pr uh, provide international courses for higher education that is open for, for everyone to attend. Today we also, uh, earlier uh, was uh, in, informing about the Norway Pacific Ocean Climate Scholarship Program that is uh, just started, which is, which is an ambit ambitious and interdisciplinary partnership on research and PhD training between the long-term partners, University of Bergen and University of the South Pacific. This is a unique interdisciplinary program where 24 young talents will, are focusing on the critical field climate and ocean nexus. And this has already been included in the first call for IOC, UNESCO, Ocean Decade, Nexus Long-Time Partnership. Finally, I will also mention that we have a new interdisciplinary CLS Fellowship Program, where we will run for the next five years. In this program, our university will be training a new generation needed for the ocean uh, in the future to, to uh, educate new ocean leaders and also uh, this has been uh, funded by Un Un uh, European Union uh, also and the University of Bergen. So this CS Fellowship Program is an important investment that will shape the direction of our marine research right now and into the future. So implementation on the whole institution approach at all levels of education is important and pressing goal that will contribute to achieve both local and global sustainability. And by these activities, we want to bring SDG 14 to the forefront of higher education. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, Ralph Sham is Assistant Director and Chief of the Financial Policies Div Division in the Institute for Capacity Development of the International Monetary Fund. Between 2014 and 2020, he was in charge of developing the Capacity Development Program for, for economists at the IMF and member countries. Ralph Shami is an experienced, experimented specialist in macroeconomics and fr of fragile states. He also developed various innovation researches on valuing nature-based solutions to climate change, focusing on large mammals like elephants and whales, for instance. Ralph, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Sylvie. Thank you all for coming. I, I was asked to talk about how to take nature to the markets or how to bring markets to nature. Um, when you, I'm a financial economist, I'm not a scientist. So when you talk about markets, the first thing that comes to mind is demand and supply. So when you want to take nature to markets, demand is for what and the supply is of what. Currently, um, the world is facing not one risk, unlike what we're being told, climate risk. We're facing actually two risks. The death of nature, which can also cause the demise of uh, human activity, and, and the climate change risk. Both risks are real. Both ris risks, any one of them were to materialize, would be the end of us. And both of them are linked together through one activity and one activity only, which is human activity. So, uh, you know, fix the human activity, you may be able, we may be able yet to fix, uh, reduce the risks to both natural capital and to climate risk. But from perspective of markets, when I look at uh, the climate change risk and I look at the Paris Accord, Paris Accord, be it rightly or wrongly, it's all defined in terms of capturing, sequestering, reducing carbon dioxide. For a market economist like me, that means there's an insatiable demand for, for carbon sequestration reduction. That's where the demand is coming from. It's being pushed by the Paris Accord and all the commitments that the world are making towards dealing with carbon. That's why the price of carbon has been skyrocketing. Okay? Then the question becomes, where will supply come from? Demand, supply. Where will the supply? Where is the technology out there that can deal with this insatiable demand for carbon sequestration? Well, you have the high tech and you have what my colleague here in the audience likes to call it earth tech. The high tech, know nothing about. We, there's a lot of nice talk and uh, promises, uh, but it's untried, untrue, and we, time is really, really short. Uh, earth tech, at least IPCC and other reports tell us, earth tech can deliver at least 37%, 40% of the needed carbon sequestration. 25% of it is in the deep ocean which is not bad. And Earth Deck is far cheaper. And last I heard, Earth was around for the last four billion years. <laughs> so there are no side effects to, Earth, to, to banking on Earth. So I decided to go with the Earth Deck for now. So and we even have a price. So you have a demand, you have a supply, you have a price. Do you have a market? No, you don't have a market. How do we, because I hear a lot, I've been here for the past week and I hear a lot uh, nature-based solutions, weeper waxing poetic, and I'm a market economist, I'm a practitioner. There is no market yet. So how do we really create a market for nature-based solutions? In order to do so, you have to start first with the science. As our colleagues here already just said, scientific knowledge is the, at the crux of this. It's the science that told us that the whales capture carbon. 33 tons, thir nine tons actually on their body, which times 11 over three is 33 tons of carbon dioxide. And multiples of that through, through their fertilization of phytoplankton. Fabio Berzaghi, he's actually here in the conference, and his colleagues discovered that the elephants in the forests of Africa enhance carbon sequestration in the bark, in the trees themselves, by 7%. And when you, when you lose those elephants, the forest loses its ability to capture carbon. Science is the one that told us mangrove, seagrass, salt marshes, all of these bodies also capture carbon. So, what science is telling us is that nature is incredibly valuable, that biodiversity is valuable. Is that enough? No. Why? Because I come from a world of policymakers. I've been at the IMF for 23 years. We don't speak the language of science. We speak the language of dollars and cents. Markets speak the language of dollars and cents. If you want to talk to the markets about the value of nature, you have to translate the knowledge that is in the science to the language that we can understand. That's what I did with my colleagues a few years ago. We, we, st we sat with the scientists and we said, okay, tell me, what are these benefits? And they said, well, the elephants capture all this carbon. Of course, I live at the IMF. We have a price for carbon. So you, you, you have to do some bit of algebra and mathematics, but you can actually capture the value of, an, of a whale. What it is, $2 million lifetime value of a whale in terms of just carbon sequestration. For the elephant, $1.75 million. For seagrass, would you like to know what is the value of seagrass, just carbon sequestration globally? Over a trillion dollars. I haven't even talked about seagrass and, and fish stocks and flood control. So you have accounting, which comes from the science. You have now the valuation. It converts natural capital 
to something we finance people call financial asset. But is it an asset that you can put on, on your balance sheet? No. Can I put an elephant on my balance sheet? No. Can I put a whale on my balance sheet? No. How do I convert it to financial capital? It's through the law. So what our colleague here was talking about. You need the law. You need policy action. That's the third pillar that I show you here. You need, you need if it's the state, the state has to say the whale belongs to the state and it has a value. If you hurt that whale, it's immediate. We don't want any more songs or poems about the sea and how much we love it. We're killing it with love. We need action. That's the action that the policymakers could take, is to declare nature a treasure. If it's in a country, a national treasure. If it's to the world, it's a world treasure. Why? Because once you add an asset and codify it in the law, we, financial people, becomes a new class of assets. At that point, the markets come in. They say, wait a minute, this is a new class of assets. If you hit a whale in the Gulf of Corcovado in Chile, the Chilean government is going to penalize you $3 million. Can we insure it? Lloyds of London comes in and so forth. What I'm describing to you is how markets really de develop. Now, since we're talking about nature, I'm done. I just want to caution you because I've seen a lot of brokers around here selling nature to countries. We have to be very careful when we bring the markets in. We are talking about natural assets here. We are not talking about financial assets. We have moral, ethical obligation towards nature. So when the money comes in, finally, you sell the carbon and the offsetters pay you the money, the money has to come in to do two things. To look after the asset in perpetuity. Meaning we got to look after these elephants and whales that are providing the service in perpetuity. Second principle is it's got to look after the local communities and the indigenous populations in perpetuity. Once you have that, and you truly have, you've moved conservation, you made it as a source of capital and economic development. Thank you, I'll stop here. Finally, carbon capture and sequestration is a multidisciplinary field of research. The first panel focused on nature-based solution. The second panel will consider the technologies of carbon removal and the industries. from Xiaomi University, China, for imposing transaction and elaborating just a bit ocean-based carbon dioxide removal, or CDR, from techniques, potential, and research needs. Based on ocean carbonate, biological, and the physical pumps, there are essentially three pathways to remove CO2 from the seawater. The biological pathway includes coastal ecosystem restoration, enhanced microalgae cultivation through, for example, fertilization or aquaring, increased cultivation and harvesting of marine-based plants. The chemical path. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for our panelists. And uh, please, Paul Holtis. I leave you the floor for the next panel. Good afternoon, everyone. So we're switching to the second panel now. And uh, Sebastian, come, you want to come down here? <laughs> Great. My name is Paul Holtus. And we're out of time in many ways. So we're out of time because we need to fix our climate solution, or our climate situation with solutions that can work now. And this is where the ocean comes in, as we heard from the previous panel, the ways in which CO2 sequestration, CO2 removal, uh, is critical to what we need to do now. The Paris Agreement has established that we need negative emission technologies. By far the biggest carbon sink, as we know, is the ocean. 
And so this combination, as, as Ralph was saying, of, of solutions, earth-based solutions and technology-based solutions, the ocean provides a tremendous set of opportunities for us. I am the founding uh, president and CEO of the World Ocean Council. We are the global blue economy business and investment organization. Uh, we work to bring together all of the ocean industries across the sectors, shipping, fishing, offshore energy, aquaculture, tourism, ports, etc., as well as the investment community to work together on advancing ocean solutions. So we have pulled together the industries. One of the, one of the uh, key areas in which we're working, and we've been working, and personally I've been involved in this since the, uh, the late 2000s, is the role of the ocean in, in carbon sequestration. The, uh, at the World Ocean Council, then, we've, we've, uh, work, we're working to operationalize that. We have a, a round table that meets monthly on uh, ocean uh, CO2 removal and blue carbon to create the business of carbon sequestration in the ocean and bring in the investment community to, to support those businesses. So just by way of introduction, um, that's the context that we bring here. We're on the verge of actually establishing now this group of companies and investors that are uh, interested and committed and have been working, many of them, for more than a decade to create the negative emission technologies that we need from the ocean and in the ocean, uh, working to create an actual industry or business association that creates this really as a new kind of industry uh, as we move forward. In addition, and, and again, building out what uh, Ralph Chami was so, uh, so well uh, articulating, the need for a market. And so really working to establish the buyers of that, uh, that carbon credit, that carbon sequestration that can come from the ocean, and in particular, to link ocean-based carbon credit opportunities with ocean-based industries. To really get the maritime sector to think about if they're going to get, make commitments, which they are, and we've heard so many this week, uh, commitments towards net zero, towards, towards uh, uh, being uh, responsible stewards in the carbon cycle uh, to focus particularly on the role of the ocean in, in, uh, in solving that problem and creating that market. So maritime to, to marine, so maritime industries to the marine carbon situation. So we have today, and I'll stop there, and as we work uh, on our side to develop the business and investment community and the business planning for the role of the ocean in carbon sequestration. So we have in this second portion of today's, um, uh, today's session uh, a panel then focusing on the technologies and the role of accentuating and, and developing the, um, the, uh, the ocean as a source of carbon removal and sequestration. And so first we're going to see this, uh, we have uh, Dr. Minhan Dai, who is Professor of Marine Biogeochemistry at Xiamen University and also a part of the Future Earth um, Network of Scientists to speak about the different marine carbon dioxide removal techniques and pathways. So with that, we can go to the video that had just started to play. Thanks. I'm Ming Han Dai from Xiamen University, China. For Paul's introduction, I'm elaborating just a bit ocean-based carbon dioxide removal, or CDR, from techniques, potential, and research needs. Based on ocean carbonate, biological and the physical pumps, there are essentially three pathways to remove CO2 from the seawater. The biological pathway includes coastal ecosystem restoration, enhanced microalgae cultivation through, for example, fertilization or upwelling, increased cultivation and harvesting of marine-based plants. The chemical pathway include ocean alkalinization, electrochemical extraction of CO2 from seawater, and finally, physical transport, which is the downwelling of seawater as a means of sequestering CO2 dissolved in the up ocean waters. I'll give you two examples. One is iron fertilization to stimulate nitrogen fixation for carbon sequestration in ocean desert or in electrophic systems. In these systems, there are preliminary evidence showing that iron limits nitrogen fixation. Therefore, with addition of iron, you have the potential to stimulate nitrogen fixation, thus enhance the carbon transfer from the surface ocean to deep ocean. 
The second example is artificial ocean alkalinization. It essentially involves dissolution of carbonates or silicate mineral, thereby increase alkalinity of the ocean to chemically increase the carbon storage capacity and thus increase the CO2 uptake. The core benefits of marine CDR include combating climate change. This is a CDR approach without land use change. And the marine CDR has the potential to keep ocean in synchronization with atmosphere, which is very crucial in low emission scenario. There are some other core benefits of marine CDR, which are adapting to climate impact synergies with existing industry and other ecosystem service. The potential of marine CDR have also the scal its scalability and the synergy in between different pathways or different marine CDR techniques. There is also possible issues involved in any of the marine CDR techniques. There are scalability, efficacy and cost, permanence, side effect in short, small scale, and the long-term large scales. And also we know that we are still lacking of governance structure, which will be covered by following speakers. After all, I think I have two key messages to convey here. One is any marine CDR technique needs thorough research and assessment. And also I have to point carbon is only one of the key ecosystem service. With that, I'd like to thank you all very much and uh, we're following this uh, dialogue. That was great, uh, very concise overview from Minhan. And we'll, we'll move on now to talk about risks and opportunities and I just highlight also the, the need for very careful, uh, considered uh, development of the prototypes and the opportunities in ocean carbon sequestration with very strong monitoring and surveillance uh, and reporting by third party uh, objectively verifiable um, data. And I think um, we have uh, to, to really look at risk and opportunity. We're very honored to have Sean Fitzgerald, director of the Center for Climate Repair at Cambridge University. Um, to join the panel now. So, Sean, hopefully the technology is working. We see you and hopefully we can hear you. Go ahead, Sean. Paul, can you give me a thumbs up? Can you hear me? Fantastic. Well, look, it's a very, very great pleasure to be able to join you uh, remotely today. I will be with you in person uh, probably from late on tomorrow afternoon. I'm going to talk very briefly about the two topics uh, that, uh, that Paul alluded to, which are the risks and opportunities. So my frame of reference is I always like to start on the positive. So I'm going to look at the opportunities first. And the way that I think we need to think about the, uh, firstly, about the oceans and in its role in um, carbon sequestration is ensuring we just ask ourselves the question about whether we are, um, whether we're just in the game of preserving uh, the oceans. Are we, are we just going to want to try and preserve what we have left? And I would argue no. Um, I would argue, actually, the state of the oceans that we have at the moment are far from what they should be. In fact, far from what they were. And therefore, I think the, the first mindset is to think about the, the use of, the, of our technologies and approaches to try and regenerate the oceans in terms of its biomass function. Uh, and in particular, then, for today's uh, relevance, is when a, an ocean is properly regenerated with its full diversity uh, in terms of biomass and the way that the things will then function, increase biomass. What does that then mean for A, the carbon content stored within the ocean, number one, and then number two, as a result of the natural processes involved, what does that actually really mean regarding the flux of carbon from the surface to the ocean bottom? So a fully regenerated um, ocean. I am very struck by reports of maybe even 400 years ago uh, when artists' depictions of an ocean teeming with life, whales are plenty on the surface waters. Were these just nice stories? Was it fiction? Or should we have a degree of humility 
and recognize that actually what we're reading, what we're seeing, were in fact tales of what was actually really observed. And I think that's the first thing we need to really think about in terms of when we're, when we're looking at the oceans, is what if it's, what's its role as a potential carbon, carbon sequestration source? But importantly, it should already be doing a lot more than it really is as a result of man's activities of the destruction of the whaling community, for example, which we have started you know, hundreds of years ago. It isn't just modern day uh, activity. This is something that's been going on for a very long time. And then, of course, more recent activity uh, leading to pollution in the oceans, which has therefore further exacerbated these problems. And then the third opportunity is looking at what does a regenerated ocean really look like in terms of therefore supporting the economies that will feed off uh, the ocean and use this for livelihoods. We've seen massive destructions of fishing stocks, for example, and huge impacts on economies and livelihoods for, for example, many of the Pacific Island states. So I think there are massive opportunities to think about the, uh, the oceans. Um, I'm just let me just talk briefly about risks, but I'm never going to talk about risks without also then talking about mitigation of those in the same breath, because one needs to think about how you might address those. And the first, as we heard from the first speaker, is that there are scientific risks for some of the approaches with unintended consequences. Um, so firstly, we need to undertake experiments uh, for certain approaches and make sure that those are controlled and that we have independent uh, monitoring and verification. And then lastly, in terms of on the scientific angle, is making sure that if there are deployments of some of these approaches, which we would sincerely like to see, that there are appropriate, appropriate governance mechanisms in place to make sure that there is no abuse, that actually we get the positive attributes of a regenerated ocean. Second risks are to do with perceived risks. Uh, in terms of making sure that we not only just listen to the voices that have already expressed opinions about some of these approaches, but that we engage all communities, and especially those who have seen massive destruction of their communities and who are likely to benefit from a regenerated ocean, making sure that we bring other voices into the room so that we can actually, A, ensure that we get the appropriate voices heard, and B, think about that in terms of the appropriate governance that's going to be in place. And then lastly, and um, this is really in Paul's domain, uh, there is a risk that businesses are not ready uh, to go and, uh, and basically capture the benefits and work with uh, potential ocean regenerated techniques. And therefore, early engagement of business is really, really important. And that's why Paul's organization is so important, trying to bring the relevant stakeholders together so that we can actually together work out the appropriate mechanisms. And that's all I wanted to say in these opening remarks, Paul. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sean. And I think that really uh, the experience that you and your colleagues and, and Sir David King bring to, into this uh, are critical to really uh, putting this, this uh, multi-stakeholder picture together in terms of how we engage across, um, across the parts of society to, to address the, the need to reduce carbon. Uh, with that in mind, and, and the last point that, that Sean brought up in terms of the role of business, uh, we, as, as mentioned by myself and Sean, are bringing together the business community around ocean carbon sequestration and blue carbon. And we have Jill Story, who is on the advisory board of Ocean Nourishment Corporation, one of the companies that's pioneering uh, open ocean um, carbon sequestration. And uh, we're very proud to have had them as a World Ocean Council member for many, many years. Uh, and so we'll hear from Jill to really bring in the business perspective to this discussion. Over to you, Jill. Jill, we're, we're not hearing you, unfortunately. I don't know if it's, that's on your side. going to try and speak again. Let's see if we've got you on. Yeah, they're, they're saying that you're muted on your side. Oh, is that working? There we go. Yep. Oh, great. Thanks, Wonderful. thanks, Paul. And thanks for the introduction. Um, and I think it's a very um, exciting time for business. I'm delighted to be um, part of the, the panel today, um, because I think we're getting close to the beginning of, of the emergence of a new market. And it is close to the beginning, because for quite a long time, we've had companies working on solutions on the supply side of the market, but we haven't had the demand side. So, for example, Ocean Nourishment's been working for the past 10 years, working on creating um, ocean CDR solutions. But it's only recently where we're now seeing the demand side in terms of all the commitments from large corporates um, with their net zero 
um, commitments. And it's going to be interesting to see how these um, net zero commitments materialize. Obviously, um, for most organizations, the core focus is going to be on decarbonizing their core operations. But for some organizations who are in um, segments where there's high capital intensity or hard to abate sectors, they're going to need to do more and they're going to need to look at removal technologies. And it's going to be challenging for these um, companies because the boards have been very skilled in terms of managing opportunities and assessing risks um, in their current um, business and in, in their current industries. But this is going to be quite a step change because it's really going to be outside their comfort zone. And some of these um, large organizations are going to have to start to take a couple of risks and actually um, you know, make some make some bold moves um, into, into this area. And it will be uncomfortable for some because not um, all of these solutions are going to be successful and there will be failures along the way. Um, one of the benefits will be, though, for organizations that do get in early, they'll pick up the skills, they'll pick up the competences into their organization and give them new opportunities um, for the future. Some organizations are starting to do this in coastal eco ecosystems. Um, it's a bit easier in coastal ecosystems in the deep ocean because um, the paths are more um, predictable in terms of the way to go. There's also um, the risk management is probably easier and there's less unknowns. So, for example, organizations like BHP in Australia are looking at, to assess the, the value of the um, coastal ecosystems. Um, it's also quite pleasing to see that governments are now starting to realise there's potential revenue stream for them too. Um, there's a, been a report by KPMG looking at the, the blue um, wealth economy, and that's quite, quite interesting to see that um, countries who realise there's value are starting to get it involved. But the deep ocean is a challenge. It's difficult. Um, there's a lot of unknowns. Um, there's a lot more um, research that needs to be done. Um, careful um, assessment and um, rigorous um, science to make sure that um, the consequences aren't um, um, worse than the solution and that um, people um, can manage this in terms of policy and regulatory frameworks. So I, th I think really um, what's um, been interesting is that we were expecting some of the companies who are already deep um, into the ocean in terms of the skills that would be the first people in here. But actually, what we've been seeing is that some of the innovators have been companies like Microsoft, Stripe, Shopify, who've actually come in to actually pre-purchase offsets at inflated prices. But it's been very valuable because it's helping um, get these solutions tested more quickly. And, and then we've got organizations like Paul's with the World Ocean Council and um, his vision that's actually been really um, um, making great strides in terms of bringing together um, business industries with the solutions because often for um, large corporates it's difficult for them to know where to find the solutions and Paul's playing a major role in creating that um, connectivity. And then there's also in the ecosystem there's organizations like Ocean Visions um, that are and climate works that are also helping um, create the ecosystem, as it were. Um, but we're not really going to have the problem so much uh, as I think we can see now on the demand side. The problem is going to be on the supply side. And I think um, at the beginning, um, Elise um, challenged everybody to say what was required to try and um, you know move us forward. And I think there's a couple of things. I think people have mentioned you know lots of the issues already about more research, um, you know managing the um, the environmental risk assessments, having independent verifiers, um, and also um, having the opportunity um, for governments to enable solutions to be tested in their national waters, you know, in quite controlled environments and um, with the right parameters around them, but to actually get the testing happening over longer periods of time. So instead of doing very short-term experiments, but to have some demonstrations over 12 months. And there will be mistakes. Um, there will be risks, there will be things that go wrong, but I think we've really got to balance that against um, the opportunity and actually what, what is the risk of doing nothing. So I think really by this time next year, we need to make sure that some of these um, opportunities have been tested in the ocean and we're not just talking about them in the conference room. Thanks so much, Jill. And that's, I mean, that's exactly right. We need to be deploying, we need to be testing, we need to really develop and operationalize the, the role of the ocean as a big part of our carbon solution in the context of it being the single biggest uh, ecosystem we've got on the planet. So we've got the global commons of the atmosphere, the global commons of the ocean, 
And so putting this whole picture together, the business development, of course, depends on investment. And now we have the money talk. We have Sebastian Soleil. Sebastian is Global Head of Energy Transition and Environment at BNP Paribas, a real leader in blue economy uh, finance. And Sebastian, over to you. Thank you, Paul. Um, yes, so in BNP Paribas, so we do quite a lot of things. And we have a foundation that is supporting uh, research projects for at least one decade uh, on climate and biodiversity. And among these projects, at least three of them are really focused on ocean uh, biodiversity. The first one is Notion, a very interesting one, and it focuses on the impact on climate, of climate change on uh, the quality and quantity of plankton in the ocean. And it's very interesting because you can see that climate change has a deep impact on plankton, so on uh, ocean biodiversity. And then uh, ocean biodiversity is l much less efficient, so is less efficient to sequestrate carbon, so has an impact on climate change. So it's really a loop, and it's, uh, we can see the nexus and the in close interrelation uh, between ocean biodiversity and climate. Uh, the second project on the ocean is CORSCAM with, um, that studies the vulnerability of uh, coastal biodiversity in um, South, uh, South America. And a third one is uh, reef services that studies impact on climate change on uh, coral reefs. So I can see as a financial institution, we can draw several conclusions from this uh, very interesting research project. The first one is there is a very, very big interrelation between climate change and uh, biodiversity, especially uh, ocean biodiversity. The second one is we know that there is an interrelation, but it's very difficult to assess it precisely and to quantify it. So we need to focus on uh, better ways to quantifying this, inter uh, this interaction and to quantifying the impact of climate change on biodiversity and vice versa. And the third thing is these issues are so complex, so interrelated that we need really to create coalitions to work on it together. And as BNP Paribas, as a financial institution, we have three big uh, topics on which we, we work quite a lot related to these three conclusions. The first one is uh, quantification and metrics. We are very much involved in the TNFD, Task Force on Natural Related Climate, uh, uh, excuse me, Task Force on Natural Related Financial Disclosure, because it's very important for us to be able uh, to quantify, to define metrics and to develop robust uh, disclosure framework to be able for us to disclose information on uh, biodiversity, on ocean preservation, and these kind of things. Uh, second thing, we work quite a lot on climate and we work quite a lot on biodiversity, and more and more we're trying to integrate both, uh, both topics because we realize more and more that it's impossible to work efficiently uh, on climate change without working at the same time on biodiversity. And third thing, we need to create coalition and we need both public and private finance to make it work. And that's why we are very much working on blended finance, uh, bringing together private um, and public fi finance. And a good example of this is a global fund for coral life. So it's, uh, um, we contributed to launch this uh, fund, this international fund with many um, uh, very interesting partners, so philanthropic, uh, UN organizations, uh, private uh, entities. So there is, for instance, the Foundation Albert de Monaco involved. And uh, with all these relevant partners, we managed to create a blended finance tool to uh, make money converge uh, in the preservation and restoration of ocean and specifically coral lives. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Sebastian. We, um, we have uh, about four minutes left, apparently. Um, and so I'd like to open up the floor for questions. I'm not sure if there's um, also ways for people uh, online to, to ask, but uh, we have a few minutes. And I just, uh, just as people, if people want to indicate if they've got a question or comment to make, 
uh, just to pull a few of these threads together as well from what we've heard today about the importance of the governance and the political license and this, uh, this uh, sense that this is a very complicated and controversial area to be moving in and the need for the social license to, to be able to move forward with ocean carbon sequestration. Uh, and that needs to be then underpinned by good data, good science, good risk assessment that we pull together in a very transparent way. And as Jill was saying, you know, business is, is ready to, to work carefully, responsibly forward. The investors are only really interested in companies that will move forward very carefully. Uh, the role of MRV monitoring, reporting, and verification is essential to all of this, which creates then additional business opportunities for the technology and the analysis to be available from uh, technology providers, from the satellite, the growing satellite industry uh, that's providing many thousands possibly of micro satellites. Also in situ monitoring at the surface through the water column and linking those kinds of data so that we know two things about, about uh, uh, blue carbon and, and ocean uh, carbon sequestration. One, we need to know and the investors really need to know and the market needs to know is the amount of carbon being sequestered that was proposed in the business models in the business plans and secondly are there uh, are we sure that there are not unacceptable unanticipated environmental consequences so we need the investors certainly the businesses themselves governments society we need to know that those two questions are being answered so there's a key role for for that uh, and linking um, as Sebastian was saying the biodiversity climate and ocean um, uh, imperatives here together as really a, a, a nexus and integrated um, uh, effort here. So any uh, any questions or comments uh, from those of you physically here? Do I have the microphone? Oh, here, there's a microphone up in the front. Thank you. If you could just give your name and affiliation as well. Sure, yes. Um, my name's Emma Hamilton. I'm with the Lidus Foundation. And I was just going to ask you um, if there was any specific type of solution that the um, World Ocean Council has noticed is um, becoming a little bit more promising than others. I would say that across the board and, and others on, on the panel here may want to, want to weigh in, we, the different pathways that Minhan outlined, um, there's, all, uh, there's potential across all of them. The one that's been, I guess, least controversial, least challenging to get started on is the macroalgae. Uh, aspect of uh, growing algae to, to take up carbon and then either work out ways to sink that to the deep ocean for long periods or take it, harvest it and take it to land, to land-based uh, disposal or uses. Um, the others, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, and I think though we need to also focus on where the, the biggest potential is. And that's come from uh, the science also telling us that perhaps ocean open ocean, open ocean uh, sequestration through nutrient enhancement uh, or alkalinity enhancement might give us the best results we need. Um, so happy to, to follow up with that with more information. This is a very active space uh, and lots we're going to be we're going to be learning lots in the next year or two about what will work best and give us the best result. Please we've got about a minute or so or less. Yeah. Are there any current examples of actual markets uh, for um, ocean sequestration of carbon where the the policy, the demand, the price, the property values have come together? Sure, I don't know if Sebastian, if you want to respond to that as well. Uh, we've just got a, uh, less than uh, 30 seconds here, but I know, um, yes, uh, please uh, go ahead. Yes, actually the, the global, uh, the global uh, fund for uh, coral reef um, to which I was uh, referring is more or less this. We try to um, um, find projects, economically viable projects, in which we can invest private and public money. And so it's mostly in relation with uh, either tourism or fishing industry, because that's the easiest um, way we can find economically viable projects uh, with these two industries. And a couple of the big technology firms that have been investing in, in carbon sequestration, and they have very rigorous uh, requests for proposal or requests for ideas and evaluation. They have, uh, there's been, uh, I think three or four companies that they've invested in. So the money is starting to flow to ocean, ocean and coastal based uh, sequestration opportunities as a part of a business uh, development. We're going to have to wrap up and uh, really appreciate all of you being here, all of you that were online, uh, the four panelists uh, and the panel that came before. And this is active space, watch this space. Hopefully next year we're looking at companies reporting on how much carbon they've sequestered in the ocean in a very safe and responsible way and driving forward with this huge, important solution 
to our climate challenges thanks very much